revolution which has been defeated, but has been defeated because they've tried to make an alliance with sections of the bourgeoisie who are not going to go along with the revolution. I'm interested in whether uh, that's uh, something which is likely to happen in this revolution. Now, we in the international Bolshevik community have tried to contribute to that discussion uh, with uh, an article in the issue of 1917, which we've been selling tonight, and which is available in the market. Um, I'll, I'll respond to that first. Um, in, in terms of uh, making alliances, uh, the, the, the revolutionary movement in Nepal has made many different temporary alliances at, at different times. Uh, most obviously with the, the sort of the, the bourgeois sort of types, if you will, um, against the monarchy. Um, but they're, they're fundamentally very conscious of the, 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 the need to for a, a new Nepal to have a, a new state uh, built fundamentally, firstly, and a, and a new state with a base in the, uh, the, the, the workers and peasants of, of, of Nepal. Um, it, it hasn't been achieved yet in Nepal, and there's a lot of uh, d debate on it. Um, I, I, yeah, uh, but yeah, there's there's no question in, in the Nepalese as to, to who this revolution is for, um, because it's, of who's leading it. Um, you know, they know that they have uh, the right to, to run a state, and uh, they, they have every intention of doing so. And uh, it's uh, a shitload more sacrifice and a bit of hard work. Um, they're on a pretty good road to, to achieving it. Um, yeah. I've recently released a statement um, about two or three months ago summing up the now current line of the party. And that line is that the principal contradiction in Nepal is between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. They see the period of alliance with the bourgeois democratic, bourgeois democratic parties against the monarchy as being over, obviously, like the monarchy is gone. So once that's achieved, a new struggle has opened up, a new contradiction has opened up, and that contradiction between the revolutionary forces, the workers, the peasants, the oppressed nationalities, and so on, and the aggressive forces, the bourgeoisie, the feudalists. And they're quite clear about that, they've been quite open about it, and I mean, ultimately we can make all the dogmatic and sectarian criticisms we like, but the fact is that a real revolution is unfolding in Nepal. It's a revolution which aims at overthrowing feudalism and then capitalism, and ultimately building a socialist and ultimately communist society that can spread throughout the entire world, you know? And it's a revolution that India, in particular, and imperialism throughout the world is going to move against. So our task and our duty as internationals is to support it, and do whatever we can to oppose moves against it. And I don't see it as internationalist to sort of snark from the sidelines. I see it as internationalist to extend material, political, and ideological support to the people of a really poor and backward country right against a hell of a lot. That's all I've got to say. Yes, it's quite interesting to sort of, you know, make suggestions to, to these fellows over there, and, you know, in one of some good suggestions. I was wondering if saying as they've actually gone quite a long way ahead of what we've done in terms of revolutions, if, if they had any ideas uh, that they gave to you that uh, how we can hurry it along ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a lesson to be learned, it's you've just got to go and uh, find the ways to relate to where people are at in your, uh, your own society and, and try and find ways to uh, relate to their day-to-day -day struggles. Um, there was nothing in specific uh, that they uh, are pretty good at running third world revolutions, but uh, and uh, very very good at running a world revolution in Nepal. But they uh, don't have the arrogance to try and tell other people how to do it just to try and support them when they're uh, having a crack. So um, I'd be interested if you, could, if you could talk a bit about how you see the peace process and the end of the armed struggle as having allowed the Maoists to advance the revo their revolutionary goals. Like how has the peace process actually moved the struggle forward? Um, the, the peace process allowed sort of two things, like firstly it, it, it sealed off the monarchy and um, brought a general agreement in Nepal that there will need to be changes to the state, so it laid the political basis for, for, for uh, sort of fundamental changes. But the other thing with the, the peace process is the Maoists have been able to really be able to present themselves as the ones that are most serious about peace and about making changes. Um, before then, when there was still the monarchy and, and still the, the, the sort of war going on, um, the other parties can say, we're serious about real change as well, we, we want to get rid of the monarchy, but it's just, it's just so hard, you know, or, or we can only do it through, through, the, through these sort of things. Uh, by it's going into a peace process, and then uh, fighting to protect the terms of that peace process, especially after the elections where the House won, um, and have been able to set the agenda of the peace process since winning the elections, 
it, it's meant that other parties have been trying to get out of that to protect the military and to protect the state. So it's very it's presented them as not interested at all, or it's proven them to be not interested at all in democracy or, 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 or fundamental changes of any kind that just to protect their own bureaucratic basis and, and, uh, and the state. I'm just wondering um, if you could kind of talk a bit about the relationship um, the overspons that the Maoists have to those kind of groups, um, like Amnesty International. I mean, I really know much about what I really do much about that. Can you explain to me a little bit about that? The, the, the Maoists um, have an interesting relationship with NGOs, and so it sort of ties into your question a bit too, or, or elaborate on it. Um, when the Maoists were in government, they proposed that uh, aid should come through the government so it could be more probably, uh, appropriately sort of set out to different projects across the country and, and more directed. There's a lot of NGOs in Kathmandu at the moment and uh, different, like some are very, very good and others aren't worth the uh, the sort of thing. Um, but it, it has sort of, like, in terms of, for a lot of them, you know, it's been very uh, sort of big profile, sort of, you know, go out to some hill in the middle of nowhere and build a few dunnings and then sort of go back. And it's sort of like, well, that's sort of great, but you know, well, what, what does that achieve? You know, when you still you've got someone clean to, to go crap, but you, you know, you still don't have medical care or um, any economic development and that sort of stuff. So the Maoists had a thing of trying to uh, yeah, get, get sort of some sort of government cooperation with NGOs um, to to make it you know, more, more directed and, and more um, you know, bring it under democratic control. Essentially.